Welcome to our next step of stirring the vision into flame. And as we gather before the image of Jesus, before his presence in the Blessed Sacrament in our Father's house, let us join together with our hearts and open them to what Jesus actually envisions us to know, to experience, to, to follow, and to know in our hearts, and to burn within us. And if you've been with us, we know we, you know we always start with an opening prayer, so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you have promised solemnly that whatever we ask you in your name, you will do. So we pray this morning in the name of Jesus and ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, Lord, and we shall be created again, and you shall renew the face of the earth. And as you come to us, Lord, Help us to catch the vision. Help to ignite it in our hearts so that it burns within us. Help us always to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, no matter what's going on around us. And Holy Mary, Mother of God, Mother of the Messiah, Mother of the Church, and our Mother, we ask you to be with us also as our intercessor. intercessor. Pray for us that we will be every day everything that Jesus, your Son, calls us to be and wills us to be. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus to the praise and glory of the Father. Amen and amen. Well, let's begin with a quick review for those of you who may be joining us uh, late in this process. But from the very beginning, Remember, we talked about the importance of having this vision, of catching it. I can't teach it to you. It can't be taught. It has to be caught. And there are interesting implications to catching the vision. And as I indicated in the first session, it always comes to serve those three purposes. The goal toward which we are always being drawn the context for everything that we do and say, and the place to which we can go when we get battered and bruised because of the realities of spiritual warfare. A place where we can be restored, renewed, invigorated, and stir the vision into flame again. It always does those three things. And then we talked about the promise of Jesus. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. From John chapter 14. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. And we followed the stream through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, of Jesus calling those 12 apostles, commissioning them to go out and do what he was doing. And in Luke, we have the story of another 72 disciples called by Jesus and commissioned to go out with the same commission to do what he was doing in his public ministry. And they did it. They lived the vision. They caught the vision. And it characterized everything they did. And then we ended up with the teaching of the church in the last session that confirms that vision laid out for us in Scripture. It's always been there, folks. It's right in front of us. And in my experience, I have found there are many people who never think of this, who aren't aware of it. Nobody's ever told them. But it's there, just waiting for us to catch it and run with it. And so today, we're going to look at what's supposed to happen to us if we catch the vision. I call this the bottom line. This is what God has in mind for you and for me in light of this vision. When it becomes the context for everything that we do, we move and breathe and live in the context of this vision. So we're going to start, having said that, 
with two statements from the New Testament that have a common thread that runs through both of them. The first of them, and I urge you to write this down from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, from verses 1 through 9. Now remember, Paul never met Jesus. He was from the next generation. But he had that mountaintop experience, as I described it, that changed his life right on the spot, on the road to Damascus, when he first enters the picture for us. And that vision that he caught burned in his heart for the rest of his life, never forgot it. And so Paul, introducing this letter to the Corinthians says this. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. I always like to remind myself and you, who else is called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God? The word apostle means one who is sent. And since the teaching of the church tells us and has always told us every single one of us has been sent, that means we're apostles. We're to be the apostles of this age. And Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to you who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy. The word holy doesn't mean pious. It doesn't mean folding our hands in a proper way. It doesn't mean saying this prayer or that prayer. The word holy basically means dedicated. So you and I have been dedicated by God. Called to be holy with all those everywhere who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We use that last line, grace to you, as one of the introductory statements of the Mass. I always find that interesting. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we're greeting one another when we gather at the altar once the pandemic is over and the lockdown has stopped, and we can come back into our Father's house. It's one of the statements that's made to us. I give thanks to my God always on your account for the grace of God bestowed on you in Christ Jesus, that in him you were enriched in every way with all discourse and all knowledge as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the implications of that. You've been given every spiritual gift. If we really believe that Jesus is living in us, has taken up his abode within us, What's missing? There's nothing missing since Jesus and the Father are one. And he's given us his spirit. We've been given every spiritual gift. The trick is to recognize the spiritual gift that we have been given. He will keep you firm to the end, irreproachable on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by him you were called to fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. To fellowship with his Son. This is the bottom line, folks. We're called to fellowship with Jesus. Now, Paul wrote those words about 23 years after the resurrection of Jesus. In the first letter of St. John, 
we have an interesting statement that John uses at the introduction of his first letter. Now, John was the last surviving apostle, the only one who had not been martyred. He was about 90 years old, or more than that, actually, because this letter was written, uh, scripture scholars think, uh, probably between the years 90 and 100. So this is some 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. But John the evangelist, the apostle, had also caught the vision. And it was burning in his heart, even though he was way up there in years, 90 years old plus. But this is what he says to begin with. Uh, this is 1 John chapter 1. What was from the beginning what we have heard, remember he's an eyewitness. He was there with Jesus and the other apostles. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we looked upon and touched with our hands concerns the word of life. For the life was made visible we have seen it and testify to it. What we have seen with our eyes, what we've heard with our ears, we proclaim now to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. Here's that word again. Fellowship with us. For our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. That you may have fellowship with us, for our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. What are we supposed to experience when we catch the vision, when we begin to live in the context of this vision, when it's burning in our hearts, it has profound implications for us. And I love that greeting of 1 John. What we have seen with our eyes, what we've heard with our ears, what we've touched and been touched by, we now share with you. So you can have fellowship with Jesus, fellowship with the Father. You know, I'm an historian, as you know, I've done a lot in my teaching career with the teaching with the church's history and, uh, and the history of Christianity. I know why we are the way we are today, where it's come from, etc. And it's amazing to me that there are so many people in the church. They may be good people, but never think of themselves as fellowshipping with Jesus. Don't even know what that means. And I find in my experience that we let a lot of holy words roll off our tongues and we never stop to think about what they mean. Words are important. And this word fellowship is a critical word for us. So what does it mean? A tale from the trenches to illustrate the point. Several years ago, I attended a diocesan meeting being facilitated by a nun who was a good friend of mine. And something was said in the course of this meeting, I don't remember what it was, but it lent itself to my responding with that line from the end of the greeting of St. Paul in the first letter to the Corinthians. So I repeated the line. God is faithful, and by him you were called to fellowship with Jesus Christ, his son. And as soon as I said that, the facilitator of the meeting, my friend, the nun, said, oh, we don't use that word anymore. And I 
said, uh, what word? And she said, fellowship. And I was kind of startled by that because I had just quoted the scripture. And I said, uh, why don't we use that word anymore? And she said, it's offensive to women. And I wanted to say, uh, offensive to women? Get a life. <laughs> but I did. I bit my tongue. And I said, sister, that is not a problem. And every woman in that meeting went totally rigid as soon as I said that. And I thought, oops, I guess it is a problem. And she said, we use the word communion. That's the current buzzword today. But we don't use the word fellowship. And so, for any of you watching who are women, if fellowship is offensive, get a life. <laughs> but let's go with the word for now because it has certain nuances that the word communion does not. So what would be fellowshipping with Jesus for you and for me. To fellowship means to be so closely bound to the other that wherever you go, the other goes. Wherever the other goes, you go. Think about that. Fellowship means to be so closely bound to the other that you share in the work of the other, the activity of the other. Fellowship means to be so closely bound to the other that when you're out there in that world around you, whatever you're doing should remind people of Jesus because he's doing it in you and through you. Whatever you're saying should remind people of Jesus because he's speaking through you, no matter what your situation is. And as I keep saying through this series, you don't have to be ordained to have this experience and to know this. Fellowshipping with Jesus means to be so closely bound to him that the two of you go together. And the example my dictionary gives is like salt and pepper, go together. That's what fellowshipping with Jesus means. It means more than just going to Mass, as important as Mass is. Whenever I say something like that, please don't call Father Mark and tell, tell him that Deacon Bill said something heretical. You don't need to go to Mass. I never said that. You come to the altar to celebrate the Eucharist, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, to receive food for our journey. The food is Jesus when he gives himself to us, his body and his blood. And that food for our journey means from this altar, from this church, out those doors, into that world around us. And remember what the church says about us out there, about you out there. No matter who you are, no matter what your circumstance is, whether you're at work or whether you're shopping or you're out there playing, of course, we all have to wait until the pandemic is over to do that again, but we're getting there. Wherever you are, you are to be fellowshipping with Jesus. You are to be speaking his words. You are to be doing his works. Remember what I shared with you from the teaching of the church about our baptism. We have been anointed. We have been raised up by God, starting with our baptism. Now, what we did with it may be another story. And if it is another story, I urge you to call up, make an appointment, and talk to one of us, one of the priests or myself. We'd be happy to talk with you about it because it's never too late to start. We were raised up by God to participate actively in the work and the ministry of Jesus as King 
prophet and priest. Ever heard that? We've been hearing that since we were this high. God has always said this to us through the church. But many, many people don't know this. Nobody's ever told them. There are people in the church, I know, my years of diaconate, ministering around the country, doing parish missions, I've heard from some of them, who think that being a disciple means just going to Mass, period. And very often I find some of them, not all of course, but some of them, when as soon as they walk through those doors, turn it all off until the next time they come to Mass. And their life out there may have nothing to do with what they celebrated here at the altar. And I remind you again of what our emeritus Pope, Benedict XVI, said about 2008. That one of the great errors of our time, he called it an error, is the separation between our life out there and what we do here. And if we fall into that error, we're in trouble. That's a red flag. If we are authentically disciples of Jesus, we can't do that. Because what we experience here at the altar is the starting point. That's why, I know I shared this with you before in this series, that's why I'm a believer in the argument that one of the most important moments of every Mass is the final dismissal. It's not a signal that Mass is over, even though there are people who think it is. The final dismissal is a commissioning. It's the sending us forth from the altar out into the world. And if a deacon is present, it's the deacon's job to give the final dismissal after the celebrant gives the final blessing. And if I'm on the altar as serving as deacon, uh, nobody has told me not to do this yet until the bishop says not to do it, I'm going to keep doing it. He's heard me say this before and he hasn't said anything about it. I always like to say, the Eucharistic celebration is ended. Now let us go forth, here's the commission, in love and in joy to serve the Lord, one another, and all of those to whom he sends us. How do we do that? What does the church mean by saying when we go out there? Our whole life is to be a proclamation the good news of Jesus. How is that proclamation to be made? It's to be made by you and me doing the works of Jesus, participating actively in his work and in his ministry as king, prophet, and priest. Letting him do within us what he's always wanted to do, which is to live in us fully, filling us with his spirit, enabling us and empowering us through the charisms of the Holy Spirit to do what he did in his public ministry. And as I always like to say, if you catch the vision and you begin to live this, you never know who's going to cross your path. You never know what circumstance the Lord is going to put you in so that you can share the good news of his love. This has wondrous implications for us because the church says, I didn't invent this. It's not my interpretation of the teaching of the church. We're to have this happen to us in everything that we do and in everything that we say. I'm always reminded, I don't remember if I gave this example in one of the earlier sessions, but I'm always, always reminded of a retreat I was asked to do in the Bay Area for about a hundred prayer group leaders from the Catholic Charismatic Renewal in the Bay Area. And when I arrived, one of the ladies that I know from that area, I know her quite well as a matter of fact, this lady is filled with the Spirit. She 
She's in love with Jesus. She's actively participating in his work and his ministry. She asked if we could talk privately, and she seemed troubled. I said, sure. So we went off to a picnic table they have on the retreat grounds where you could get some privacy, and she started crying. And she said, I don't know where to begin. So I said, well, start at the beginning. It's always a good place. How can I help you? And she said, well, uh, I was telling one of the priests in my parish, this is not a cap on the priests, incidentally, about this retreat and that I was going to attend. And then she's crying a little more now as she's telling me this. And she said, he, he responded by saying, you people are out in left field. You people, notice the language, you people are out in left field. I'm where the church is with an incarnational model of the church. And you are out in left field. And I don't want anything to do with you. And when she said that, I thought immediately, I didn't say it to her, but I thought immediately, well, there goes all of our hospitality. I've been telling somebody in the parish, I don't want anything to do with you. Anyway, she said to me, I don't even know what he's talking about. What's an incarnational model of the church? And I said to her, well, to be truthful with you, I've heard the phrase, but I've never studied it. So let me go home after we're done here. I'll do some homework, and then I'll call you, and we'll talk more. Okay, she said. So then we went on. I did the retreat, and so on and so forth. When I got home, first thing I did was I went down to the chancery, uh, to the ministry center that we had there at the time, and it had a very good library that had been accumulated over the years, and I asked if they had any books or whatever uh, on this subject of an incarnational model of the church, and I was told, oh, yeah, we've got a whole bunch over here, right over here in the, in the shelf. You know, take, take what you want. So I went over and I kind of went through them and I picked out several of the books and then I discovered that a whole pile of tapes uh, on the subject. So I grabbed a couple of the tapes, checked them all out, and went home. And the first thing I did was I listened to one of the tapes. It was a talk on the subject by a priest in Los Angeles. And I remember he was a really good teacher. And he went through the whole thing on this tape. And I'm sitting in my library listening to this. And I hadn't been listening for more than just a couple of minutes. And I wanted to jump up and down and click my heels and say, yes, this makes sense out of everything. So in a nutshell, I'm summarizing what he told us for you. <laughs> in a nutshell, it sounds like this. The incarnation occurred the moment Mary said yes to the announcement of the angel that she had been chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. That's her fiat. In that instant of time, the word became flesh in her womb. That's the incarnation. Nine months later, that word that had become flesh in her womb was a fully formed baby and was born. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Jesus grew up. We know very little about his childhood through his young adult stage. We don't really pick up the story until he's 30 years old and he's baptized in the River John, in the River Jordan rather, by John the Baptist. I think the coming of the Holy Spirit settling over Jesus in the form of a dove, you can check this out in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all talk about the baptism of Jesus. I think that was an empowering experience for the humanity of Jesus because there's no mention of Jesus having power until that moment. That's why Luke says Jesus came out of the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's baptized, he goes into the desert, he wrestles with the devil, trying to tempt him out of his ministry, and then he launches his public ministry. And on his journey to Jerusalem, he's doing all kinds of wondrous things, signs and wonders, Peter will call them, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, always proclaiming the good news of, of the kingdom. That's the works of the Messiah. He ran afoul of the leaders. He was condemned. He was tortured. His passion 
He was crucified and died on the cross. Now, three days later, he was raised from the dead. We celebrate that at Easter. Forty days, fifty days later, the Spirit was sent again. This time with an empowering experience. That's Pentecost. And then Jesus rose to the Father. Before Pentecost, but he rose from the Father about 40 days after his resurrection. Jesus of Nazareth rose to the Father. And here's the, here's the kicker in this vision of an incarnational model of the church. Jesus of Nazareth rose to the Father's side and was declared to be Lord. The risen Christ continues to live in his body, the church. And who is his body, the church? It's you, it's me, it's all of us. The risen Christ continues to live in you and in me. And guess what he does as he continues to live in you and in me? He continues the public ministry of Jesus. That's why we are empowered to do the works of Jesus if we catch the vision, if we run with it, if we let it be planted in our hearts so that it burns within us. We're never supposed to, uh, to, to forget it. And wherever we go, that ministry, those works of the Messiah are to be flowing out of us. That's why it's so important to understand what the word fellowship means. Because wherever we go, whatever we're doing, whatever we're about, no matter what it is, the works of Jesus are to be manifested by what we do. Everything that we do and everything that we say. I'll say it again. You don't have to be ordained to do this. It does help to be baptized, but you don't have to be ordained to do this. It's not just the priests, it's not just the pope and the bishops and cardinals, the deacons, not just the nuns. It's every single baptized believer. We're living in a time of great upheaval. And I'm not talking just about the coronavirus and the lockdown. We're living in a time of upheaval in the church as well. There are many people who have not caught the vision. I think of a, one of the most frightening statistics I have heard, and I got this several years ago, from our Celebration of Ministries Day right over here in St. Mary's High School, when the keynote speaker was a priest by the name of Father Patrick Brennan, no relationship to me. I wish he was. Uh, and I listened carefully to what he had to say in his keynote address because we got him right after he finished serving for about 12 years, I believe, as the chair of the American Conference of Bishops Evangelization Committee. So I figured this guy is worth listening to. He's had his finger on the pulse of the church for the last 12 years or so. And he dropped this statistic on us. The largest community of Catholics in the United States is comprised of the inactive. 75%. The inactive are those who, if they show up, it's at Easter, it's at Christmas. I always add Ash Wednesday. It's amazing how many people come crawling out of the woodwork to get free ashes. Then we may never see them again until next Ash Wednesday. But that's what they do. They come at Christmas, Easter, Ash Wednesday. 25% show up on Sunday. But of the 25% who show up on Sunday, 10% are doing all the work. That's an interesting statistic, isn't it? I would say those 75% who are inactive 
more likely than not, don't even know there is a vision. Certainly haven't caught it. The 25 who are active may or may not have a vision. The 10% who are doing all the work, more likely than not, have caught the vision. And they're living it out. And what they're doing in the parish, in the church, but also in the world around them. That's a pretty scary statistic when we stop and think about it. So we're supposed to catch the vision. We're supposed to run with it. We're supposed to allow it to burn in our hearts. I titled this series, Stirring the Vision into Flame. Because it's a play on words from Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, where he says to Timothy, stir into flame the gift you received when I laid my hands on you. That's ordination language. Timothy was a bishop in the early church. Well, he wouldn't have told Timothy to stir the gift into flame unless the gift can be stirred into flame. He didn't say to Timothy, I'm going to do it for you. The Blessed Mother is going to do it for you. You have the power to stir that gift into flame. And once we have caught the vision, every one of us has the power to stir it into flame. So I'm simply playing on those words. The vision is a gift. Stir it into flame and watch what God will do. He's a God of surprises, isn't he? And he's constantly surprising us. He's a God who loves to do new things in us. He's not limited to our programs, as important as those programs might be. And every now and then, if we're fortunate, we can have the experience of God doing something new within us and through us in the ministry to which he's called us. It all comes together with that word fellowship. Fellowshipping with Jesus. Fellowshipping with the Father. Being so closely bound to him that we are one. I think Jesus was talking about the same thing. He's using the same language when he says, I live in you, you live in me, I live in my Father. And we're all bound together. When we celebrate Jesus, we're celebrating the Father. Remember he said, whoever sees me sees the Father. Whoever hears me hears the Father. And he even had some pretty strong things to say about living out the vision. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? This is Jesus talking now. And not do what I tell you to do. What's a person like who hears my word and puts it into practice? I'll tell you what he's like. I'm paraphrasing the statement. He's like the man who built his house on a solid foundation of rock. When the storm came, not if, when the winds blew, when the flood came, not if, they could not knock that house down because it was built on a solid foundation. And what is the person like who hears my words and does not put them into practice? I'll tell you what that person is like. Like the man who built his house on a foundation of sand. When the winds came, when the flood came, when the storm came, they knocked the house down and great was its wreckage because it was built on a foundation of sand. Catching the vision means living the vision. And our hearts should burn within us as we live the vision. God can do anything. And very often in the entire history of the church, God chooses the least likely person, or the one whose contemporaries might have said, well, not him or not her, 
How can that person do this or that? Sometimes God uses that very person to make his point, to reveal his power and his love. As I said before several times, you never know who's going to cross your path. And you might get nudged by the Spirit to talk to that person. You never know who's sitting next to you in the pew, even if you're six feet apart, <laughs> who may be carrying a burden, who may be struggling with something in his or her life, who may be drowning in a sea of sorrow. And you may experience God saying, share the good news with that person, him or her. And you may discover God using you as an instrument. I use an example like that because I remember in the 1990s I was part of an outreach called the Holy Spirit Institute. It was the dream of the late Father Emile de France, who was from the Center of Jesus the Lord in New Orleans. It was right on the edge of the French Quarter. And we did it for four summers, this team that I was part of. In June, we did it in Saginaw, Michigan at a retreat center. In July, we did it in New Orleans. And in August, we did it in Jamaica. Two of us went to Jamaica. And one of those summers, about a week long, uh, we invited people to come, and, and it was full immersion for them. Uh, we were doing it in Saginaw, Michigan in June of that year. And at the high point, we got all the people into small groups. It's like on a Wednesday night. Uh, and then the team went out and gathered people around these small groups, and we prayed over them for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I noticed, as everybody took their place and the team went out and they started the prayer, everybody had joined one of the small groups, except for one lady. She sat in the front row. She never moved. She had her eyes closed. And I was prompted to go pray with her. And so I went up to her and I sat down beside her. And I said, may I pray with you? And she said, oh, okay, sure. And so I started praying with her. I put one hand on her shoulder, the other hand on her forehead. And I just started praying. And as I was praying for her, a vision of her life. It was as if I was looking through the big end of a telescope. Ever done that as a kid? You look through the big end of the telescope and it looks like you're looking down a tunnel and at the end is a small thing, small vision, if you will. And in this vision of her life, that's what I saw. And at the end of this tunnel was a little door. It looked like it was very solid could see little hinges on it and a lock. And I asked the Lord in my heart for discernment, help me understand what I'm seeing here. And I got it. I know that because of what transpired. So I said to her, you know, sometimes when I'm praying over someone, uh, the Lord gives me a vision of what's happening in the person's life. This is what I'm seeing. And I described it to her. I said, my sense is you have given everything to the Lord except for one area of your life that you've locked him out of. You've locked that door. That's what the door represents. And I'm hearing the Lord saying to you, if you unlock that door and open it, you are going to be filled with the Spirit and transformed. Of course, she started crying. And then she came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, you are absolutely right. I have kept God out of one area of my life. She never told me what it was and I never asked her. <laughs> but she said, I'm going to do this. Now, it later transpired. I kept in contact with her for a while. When she came to this experience we were offering, in her mind, it was going to be one of the last things she did. She was going to leave the church. 
she was so disillusioned with life in her parish that she was going to leave the parish and then leave the church. But something happened for her when she unlocked that door and opened it. And she fell in love with Jesus and fell in love with the church. And the last I heard from her, she had become an active member in her parish, one of the 10%, was in charge, I think, of adult education, uh, etc., and was going great guns, living the vision. That's an example how you never know who's going to cross your path as you fellowship with Jesus. So sisters and brothers, I believe God is inviting us in the very beginning of this series to open our hearts, to accept the vision that he has of us and for us, to let him plant it in our hearts so that we catch it, so that we catch it, and then empowers us to live it. That's his dream for you and for me. And a person may say, but I, I'm just little old me sitting in a pew. God can't do that in my life. Not true. Because God did it in my life. I wasn't a deacon. I'm just an average, ordinary guy. And yet God did it. And I've never forgotten. You may think, well, I've got a job. I've got a family. I've got kids at home. I've got to take care of them. More power to you. That's your primary Mission field, right there in your family. That's where you live the vision initially, but then reaching out into the community around you. God has that dream for you and is hoping against hope you will say yes to it so that Jesus can truly come alive within you, completely transform you, Maybe send you to where you never thought you could go. That was certainly true in my case. Maybe calling you to something more. There is such a thing as the more of God's love. And he's knocking at the door. He says this in the book of Revelation. Behold, I knock at the door, and whoever opens the door, I will come in and sit with him, her, and share a meal. That's another way of saying fellowship with him. And if you've ever seen the paintings that have been done of that statement, they always show a door, but there's no, there's no lock on it. There's no handle on it. And you're supposed to pick up the, the meaning, but the handle, the lock, is on the inside of the door. And the only person who can unlock the door and open it is on the inside. That's a representative of you and of me. Only you can open the door. Only I can open the door. But we have the promise of Jesus. And when we do that, he will come in and sit with us. That's fellowshipping with Jesus. So I urge you to think about these things to sit with those opening statements from 1 Corinthians and the first letter of John because I believe God is sending you to say to that world out there in one way or another what we have seen with our eyes, what we have heard with our ears, what we have touched and been touched by, we now share with you so that you can have fellowship with us. For our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the gift you have given to us in Jesus, your Son. We thank you and praise you for the gift of faith, we thank you and praise you for the gift of the church. We thank you and praise you for the gift of life. We thank you and praise you for the gift of our families, our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, and even have great-grandchildren. 
And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of this world that is dying to hear from us the good news of your love. You have promised that whatever we ask you in your name, you will do. And whatever we ask the Father in your name, the Father will do so as to be glorified in the Son. And so we ask in the name of Jesus with confidence, send forth your spirit, Lord. Melt us in the fire of your love. Mold us into your presence in the church and in the world around us. Fill us with your gifts and your charisms and use us so that wherever you send us, whatever you command us to do and say, it will bring ever more glory to your name and ever more of your love to your people. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus to the praise and glory of the Father. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we have one more session, we're going to do it next Wednesday morning, in which I'm going to share with you a story about an average ordinary guy who had a most extraordinary encounter with the risen Christ and the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit that changed everything. So please come back and hear this story. God bless you until we meet again.